Well, it, it was not a, an easy transition. I, I tried to get a job when I came to Hollywood. There was no opportunity, but I was fortunate to get a job with an industrial filmmaker. And that was the greatest training around the world. You would go out with two guys and make work for a year, do a film on the Southern Pacific Railroad, and that had more influence. And then I, I got involved thanks to a marvelous photojournalist by the name of Donald Barnes, who's no longer known as the And uh, he approached me, came up there, and I was dissatisfied with the income I was receiving. And uh, he said, why don't you get into this titty world game? So, yeah. <laughs> and I said, I don't know anything about that. You know, doing industrial movies on railroads, and you know, ordering you know, paper machines, things of that nature. This is what you like to build the income to this guy. <laughs> you know, I came to combine an industrial movie with uh, so-called nudity or glamour and things of that nature. That's why uh, most of my films do resemble industrial movies. <laughs> sermon at the end or the sermon in the beginning. <laughs> Pointing out the shortcomings and the frailties of the people borrowing from their own personal existence. <laughs> I need to do another one now. I've been on a book for three and a half years and I think it's time. Roger's come up with a great script. And God wills it. We'll make a, another Dolls. <laughs> John Waters' shock value, he talked about, you talked about already writing a sequel, and that had something to do with Elvis? Yes, this is a film called, um, is it called Up the Valley of the Beyond? Or? <laughs> I sometimes confuse my title. Yeah, I mean, it was also Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens, Son of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and my personal favorite, Into the Chasm of the Hyper Vixens. <laughs> play that was um, originally part of a two-picture deal at AIP, and uh, Super Vixens was the other part of that deal, but AIP bailed out and Russ made and released Super Vixens himself to enormous success. Uh, the movie involves um, characters that might make you think of Elvis and Howard Hughes. Um, there's Dr. Pretorius down in his dungeon trying to give people the secret of eternal life through injections of the pituitary glands from pregnant beavers. There was Reuters, the two-time Pulitzer Prize winning correspondent for Rolling Stone magazine, Moshe Sabra, the crack agent for Israeli intelligence, uh, Krakow, the uh, loyal assistant, uh, Elmo Trimblor, the strongest man in the world, who I left out. Uh, I think my favorite scene comes when uh, Marilyn Reuters is shackled above a 22 foot high wary blender. <laughs> and, uh, Dr. Pretorius is about to pulverize her so that he can inject her into Elvis. While uh, uh, Trimbler and uh, Moshe Sabra are trying to break their way through the stout open doors of his underground dungeon. And they are able to save her just in the nick of time because Dr. Pretorius' finger wavers for a second between blend and puree. <laughs> Uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts. 
Massachusetts. And her name was Asplinden, that was her last name. And she wanted to know if she could order a copy of Beneath the Valley of Contradiction. She said, it's the funniest film I've ever seen. Of course, I agreed with her. <laughs> it's, a, it's probably the most popular film I have. Um, it was interrupted. Roger and I were going to do a film on the Sex Pistols. And uh, I had shot the film beforehand. And uh, this opportunity came along for us to work on their gym in Britain. And Roger wrote a great script called uh, Anarchy in the UK and Who Killed Bambi and so on. Unfortunately, the man who uh, was their manager didn't have sufficient funds to make a picture. I earned a lot of money and we had a good time. Something or another, but uh, regrettable films we made. We made we shot some three days. And, you know, I wish that they had made a documentary called The Making of Who Killed Bambi. If only so they could have had the scene in it where you silenced Johnny Rock, who was protesting his wages at five pounds a week, a can of baked beans, and a six pack of beer daily. <laughs> and uh, that, that was what Malcolm McLaren was paying, and that wasn't what you were paying. And I remember once you met with Johnny and uh, Sid Vicious, and Johnny was getting a little bit out of line, and you turned to him and you said, Listen, you little whippersnapper. We fought the Battle of Britain for you, and we'll fight it all over again, and this time you'll go into the drink. <laughs> now, what's amazing was that this completely silenced Johnny Rotten, who for the next uh, several days of our relationship listened to everything Russ said and agreed with him and uh, obeyed all of his orders. Johnny Rotten apparently didn't know, A, that America didn't fight the Battle of Britain, and B, that he was Irish. <laughs> I regret that I didn't answer all those points the young lady made. Um, the, uh, you were comparing uh, the fact that uh, probably presented the uh, so-called, for want of a better expression, the girl girl sequence in Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, which I thought was a very attractive and a very sexy presentation of two women that um, handled themselves exceedingly well and projected the point very well as, as also in addition to that. Um, but by and large, when I show a confrontation between uh, the sexes, it's generally a contest. It's generally kind of, uh, it's more combat than, than something that's soft. It's meant to be outrageous and smoothy and uh, bigger life, or at least a little bit bigger than that. Um, in, in the case of, uh, of Lamar Shedd, who was the young man who spurned the affections of Asa Lambert, who was both a dentist and a marriage counselor, hardly equipped to find the job. And it was never made clear as to who would do it to whom. But I thought myself always that, that, that Lamar Shedd, meaning the young hero, was to be the recipient. Well, most of the horrors to begin with. Make a buck, they release it. 
This film was very successful. Uh, this is the 20th anniversary of the picture. Some people think the film was not a success. I'm proud to say that owning 10% uh, of it, I got my check last month, 20 years. Not too many films pay off that long. I want to put it on a monetary level, but yes, I uh, have every reason to believe that the film would be just as successful today as it was now. Ox was very much in need of a monetary transfusion. They were shocked by the fact that it did get an X rating. Uh, one thing, uh, I pleaded, I pleaded the case, but it was unsuccessful. I recall uh, the puzzlement on the part of Richard Zanuck, Brown, so on and so forth, and the distribution arm, and they saw a rough cut of it. And, uh, <laughs> no one really understood it, like Roger and I did. Zanuck uh, said to uh, the head of distribution, he said, uh, he says, I, 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 what, he said, Peter Myers, he was the head of distribution. He says, what do you think we got to do? And Peter said, well, I think what we have to do is take this and put it to 50 theaters and hope to make some money with it because we're very much in need of a cash flow or increasing our cash flow. And I had to rise to the floor. This is my baby. I have worked with it, you know, for a long, long time. As any of the films I've made, it's always a very personal issue. Well, any filmmaker, any kind of content uh, would feel much the same as I did. I got up and, of course, offended with this distribution. I said, no, this is not the way to do it. What you have to do is get one theater on the board and let the film build, let the people talk about it. It's good reviews, hopefully. Even bad ones, they work just as well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when Zanuck said, well, that sounds like a good idea, he turned to Peter and he says, uh, anything available on the boulevard? And Peter jumped up and says, no, there's nothing available. And Zanuck had his brightest hour. He stood up and he said, go out and buy it, Peter. So we ended up with the Pantages. And the rest was history of the film. It still plays to this day. I, I had the good fortune of going to Moscow. Charming, <laughs> together with Super Vixens and Mud Honey. Uh, Mud Honey, I was called into taking, which is uh, some looked upon by some people as an interesting Gothic uh, presentation on my part. The Russians didn't go for it, it was just too damn depression, depressing. But they loved Super Vixens, which starred Charles Napier as Harry Sledge, and they loved me on the mountain. And instead of one screening, we had six screenings with each of these. We even went out into the neighborhood theaters that showed the films, always packed. I had a marvelous lady who, who was uh, uh, one of those United Nations types of translators. And she was able to take every part and translate it. The audience just hung in there with that. And if she got a little bit behind her, it started clapping. Uh, my uh, reaction to the Soviet changed enormously after having you know, visited the country and noticed the people saw in something that I had produced many, many years before. In each instance, and embraced it so warmly, and enjoyed it just like us folks do. You know, what the critics at the time thought of this movie? Um, I, I want to just add something to what just said, if I could. Um, if you look at the official corporate history of 20th Century Fox, published by the company on the occasion of its corporate anniversary, you won't find any mention of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> If you read uh, David Brown's the recent autobiography, he lumps it in with minor Breckenridge, another picture made at the same time, and dismisses them in less than a paragraph as flops. The movie grossed in $1970, $47 million, and it cost $900,000 to make. 